Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission show. If you've had a terrifying encounter at work, send us your story at eeriecast.com slash submit so I can narrate it. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? I've only ever had to call the cops once while working at Dead and Roasted. And that was just because the rog mites were back and attacking guests who used the bathroom. Those buggers love to crawl up from the sewer and bite into a cheek or two. I mean, who doesn't? Anyway, today's stories feature a police encounter with something far more disturbing. As fans of true crime like to say, sometimes people are the scariest monsters of all. These are Tales from the Break Room. Something wanted my attention. From M. R. Akinosferu. I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm actually an annoyingly skeptical person. Generally, when paranormal things happen, my brain just jumps to the closest rational explanation. Usually, it's my paranoia of people, who, if you ask me, are way scarier usually than ghosts. So, I used to work at a Walmart overnight as a stalker. When the plague started, we closed at 8 p.m. and opened at 9 a.m., leaving a very small crew to stalk from 10 to 6. Now, at this point, I'd already had several weird experiences, but nothing I couldn't just chalk up to a customer back when we were open 24 hours. Except for the ghost birds, I'll get to that in a second. This particular night, however, there's just no explanation for. It was already a really hectic night, with a skeleton crew of five to stock, zone, and overstock all the dry grocery, frozen, and dairy. Sometimes when you're on the ladders in this particular store, and on certain aisles, you'll see something small and white fly by at about eye level, which would put your eye level at about seven feet off the ground. This would only occur at about six feet, and it only seemed to happen in the wine, chips, and paper aisles, never anywhere else. We jokingly referred to them as the Walmart ghost birds because they were about the size of a pigeon and acted like they were dive-bombing you. That night, I was putting extra peanut butter on top of the shelf, and I saw one of these ghost birds twice. By that point, though, I had just accepted it. They were never close enough to really bother me, but the whole atmosphere felt different from the time I pulled into the parking lot. It was just this awful, sinking feeling. Around 1.30 that morning, right before my break, I went off to the bathroom. This bathroom had three stalls with a heavy door, and at the time I was the only female in the building. So when the door opened, and I saw white high heels and the bottom of a white pencil skirt walk to the accessible stall. My first thought was someone had come in through the front door. It was shut off but not locked, and we'd had issues for weeks of people just ignoring that we were closed, trying to get inside. Usually, there was someone on the water aisle to stop them, but because there were only five of us that night, including the manager, we were going to all tag team it when everything else was done. That meant no one would be in sight of the door for several more hours. I heard the footsteps, I saw the door open, and I heard the stall door close. I quickly went out to confront her, but I couldn't see feet anymore. First, I knocked on the stall door, informing anyone that we were closed. Then I bent down a little to see if I could see the heels but there was nothing. At that point, I was kind of scared that she was trying to rob us. Maybe she was standing on the toilet to avoid detection. But when I went to try the door, it was unlocked. I felt a weird sense of relief that there wasn't another person I was going to have to confront, but also freaked out that there was definitely not a living person in that bathroom besides myself, despite what I just encountered. There was only one way in and out, and the whole thing had lasted maybe 30 seconds. She had definitely not come back out. 
Now, I do occasionally listen to true crime, so I did a thorough search of the bathroom, short of climbing onto the toilet to check the vents, because they're standard American cubicle stalls, and I would have seen her do that. There was no one else in there. That really creeped me out, and the entire time I was washing my hands, I felt as if someone was angrily staring at me. So in a hurry, I left and went back to work. I know this sounds like a really nonchalant reaction, but I've had enough paranormal encounters that, for the most part, I just try to ignore them when I determine that there's no other explanation for them. Whoever or whatever this was was not having it, because as I was now stalking cereal, I had just opened a box and was standing perfectly still looking for the barcode, when suddenly I felt fingers grab the hair behind my ear, brush my ear, and yank so hard it pulled my head to the left. I really didn't know what to think at that point, because the rational side of my brain said it was just my coworker screwing with me. But I had not seen nor heard anything, and as fast as I turned, there should have been someone there. They wouldn't have time to hide. Not to mention, while I had a good working relationship with most of the guys at the time, I just couldn't see them doing something so invasive as a prank. I decided to go ahead and go to lunch. It was already 1.52 a.m. So I went out to my car like I did every night. It was a well-ish lit parking lot, and I always parked as close to the door as I could. So I double-checked the back seat, I got in my car, locked the doors, leaned my seat back, and began scrolling through YouTube to find something to listen to. I was really trying to forget about that creepy and painful nonsense, so I was looking for something funny, lighthearted. But I still just had this overwhelming sensation of being watched. Usually, ignoring this feeling will eventually make it go away. I had mixed thoughts, like... Whoever this is just needs to go away. And what if there's a creep in the bushes and I just didn't see them on my way out? It was a closed Walmart at 2 a.m. after all. Prime real estate for creeps, especially in a college area. Most of my break went by outright forcing myself to pay attention to anything other than the creepy feeling, while seeing what I thought was raccoons or something darting behind my car in the mirror every few minutes. Then, for a split second, I saw this tall shadow walk up to my car and disappear behind it. That's when I felt something blow in my ear. It was like someone had leaned up between the seats and blown in my ear like they were trying to get a bug off. I could even feel hot breath moving my hair. Rational me went into fight mode. I grabbed my box cutter and turned around, ready to cut someone. But my back seat was empty. It was probably stupid of me, but now I wasn't sure if it was a ghost or a person, so I got out of my car and opened every single door. No one. I even looked for spider webs. I checked the seat belts. There was nothing even on that side. So I closed up my car, locked it, and on the way back to the door, I saw a shadow walk into the middle of the street, about ten feet away, and just disappear. This shadow figure was about five foot nine and very thin. I stared at it for about five seconds before it had disappeared, trying to figure out if I was seeing a person with clothes similar enough to the pavement to make them look transparent or if they were actually just a walking shadow. Then, like that, it was just gone, like it blinked right out of existence. But as it disappeared, so did my anxiety and that feeling of being watched. I didn't have a problem for the rest of the night. Now, here's the kicker. A few days later, I went back in for work and there was a memorial on the break room table for a previous co-worker who had just recently died. I can't say for sure if it was that co-worker's ghost, and if it was, why would they do those things? 
but it was one of the weirdest coincidences of my life. It was also extremely uncomfortable, because it's the first and so far only time I've had something mess with my hair. It's creepy enough when actual dudes blow on your ear, but it's so much worse when there's no physical person there to slap. The Paint Contractor From Cherylay H In 2002 through 2004, I worked as a decorative product specialist at a paint store chain. My job was to work with clients in the store, at their home or job site, in an interior design capacity. Essentially, I helped with choosing paint colors, wall coverings, and the like. It was a brand new store and there were only three employees, the general manager Jimmy, the assistant manager Joel, and me. That being the case, plus me having to work around my college classes, meant that I worked a lot of evening and weekend shifts alone. The majority of paint business sales come from contractors. We worked hard to establish relationships with them. With it being a new store, we put up with more than we should have for the sake of getting and keeping more of those contractor sales. While my bosses dealt more with their low bids, I dealt with their lowbrow humor. It is a male-dominated environment to be sure, and quite a few found my presence a real novelty. Nowadays, the kind of things I endured would never be tolerated, thank God. There was one particular contractor who tested all of our patients. I'll call him Frank. Frank was around 50, 6 feet tall, and built like the farmer he'd been most of his life. He worked on his own, and it didn't take long to understand why. He was extremely sexist, demanding, and rude. After the first month or so of coming in, he began to make inappropriate comments to my coworkers about me. Then he began to do it directly to me. Over the course of a year, his unwanted attention increased in intensity. One day I was ringing up a customer when Frank came in. As I turned to fulfill the order, he nudged the guy and said, Look at that rear, best in town. The customer didn't know how to respond. He looked shocked. Come on, isn't it great? You know it is. Frank continued to goad him. I was annoyed, and the customer looked mortified. This kind of thing became a regular occurrence. My bosses called him out on this multiple times. Then things turned up another notch. One day, I was crouched down, refilling a wallpaper display. Jimmy was at the counter with a customer. Joel was mixing paint, and another customer or two were in the store browsing. There was a main front door and a small side door most of the contractors used. For whatever reason, Frank decided to come in through the front that day. Being crouched down behind the display like I was, I didn't think that he could see me. I decided to stay there a moment, hoping to avoid him. Now I wonder if he had been watching me from outside. Barely two feet in the door and forty feet from the counter, Frank loudly exclaimed, Jimmy, there's one reason I come to this store. Everybody turned. I saw Jimmy visibly tense up. Ever the diplomatic manager, he forced a smile through clenched teeth, bracing himself. And what is that, Frank? He replied. A little color raced into his face as he straightened his spine. Her. At this, Frank pointed straight at me. She's the hottest piece in this town. I felt all the color drain from my face. This was different than his prior rudeness. He was becoming bolder. It didn't matter that there were so many people around. In fact, he was either feeding off of the audience, or our discomfort, or maybe both. Frank, that's enough. We're happy to work with you, but that kind of behavior is not appropriate. Let's keep things professional here. Jimmy was struggling with how strong he needed to be for his words to be effective while not giving the wrong impression to everyone else in the store. For the next bit, you need a little context concerning the layout of the store. The front two-thirds of the store was the main selling floor. Then there was the main counter with an office to the right. 
A four-foot-tall wall behind the counter separated it from the mixing area, and the mixing area was about 12 by 20 feet or more. Doors on either side of the back wall of the mixing area led to the warehouse. There was a good bit of space around the short wall and the main counter, so we could travel easily to and from the warehouse. Depending on the size of the order, we would stage contractor orders either in the mixing area near the office or inside the warehouse. Knowing this, most contractors came in the side door that was near the office, directly in line with the main counter. Anyway, a couple of days after the yelling and pointing incident, Frank began standing in the mixing area just past the office when he came in. He wasn't technically behind the counter, but he was past it, if you know what I mean. It was an intentional push against the boundaries. When Jimmy saw Frank's truck pull up outside the side door one day, he turned to me, quickly saying, Go to the warehouse. I understood immediately. This became the plan any time we saw Frank pull up. I'd run to the back and find something to do until he left. But Frank wasn't stupid. It went from, Where is she? To, I know she's here. And then to, I saw her car outside, I know she's in here. That last one he said one day as he walked straight past the guys and into the warehouse in search of me, like I was prey. There you are, what are you doing? Trying to hide from me or something? He tried to laugh it off as a joke. No one joined him in laughing. Jimmy, his wonderful linebacker-sized self, came to stand in front of me. He herded Frank out of the warehouse saying that it was off limits, and so was I, period. He said that he needed to leave me alone. I so wish that had been the end of it. Just days later, I was closing the store alone on a Friday night. Earlier in the day, Jimmy had mixed an order for Frank, leaving it in the mixing area. Frank had said he needed it first thing Saturday morning. Of course, he decided to pick it up five minutes before closing that night, when I was alone. My stomach clenched when I saw him come in. Before I could get to the counter, he followed me to the stack of cans, you know, so he could look over the order. I became very aware of the situation, our size difference, his intimidating body language, the fact I was alone, the fact that no other customers would be coming in since we were now supposed to be closed. Uh, this isn't what I ordered. I specifically told Jimmy that this isn't what I wanted. He was raising his voice and standing way too close to me. I tried calming him down as I backed away. Let me give him a call and see if we can sort it out. I couldn't dial the number fast enough, but it went to voicemail. Uh, Jimmy, it's me. Frank is here and says that this isn't what he ordered. He's very upset. Please call as soon as you get this. With every word, I tried to convey the situation. I dialed again. Voicemail. I hung up. Uh, let me check what we have in the computer. Maybe he made a mistake, I said, using the opportunity to get away from Frank. Yeah, it's a mistake. You'd better check it out. He was coming behind the main counter now. Fear washed over me. I dialed again and no response once more. Why had we abused calling Jimmy's cell with stupid questions in the past? Jimmy, pick up, I thought. I could just imagine Jimmy sitting at the dinner table rolling his eyes. He was intentionally not answering because he wanted me to figure out whatever it was on my own so he could eat in peace. I dialed again. No answer. Frank kept up his diatribe. I looked at the computer. Well, uh, Frank, this looks like it matches what he made up for you. You calling me a liar? He was literally yelling now. There was no reason for this. The man looked possessed, an expression of pure rage covering his face. Dial, no answer, hang up, dial again. At that point, Frank leaned over me, arms raised in protest, yelling in my face. I don't even remember what he was saying. Full on terror had me ready to dial 911. Then the phone rang in my hand. Thank God. Our standard greeting was barely out of my mouth when Jimmy cut in. Cheryl A., are you okay? 
No, Frank is wanting his order for the morning, and it isn't what he was expecting. Jimmy, get the point. Oh, I understand you. I'm already heading to the car. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Jimmy knew that the situation must be serious. At that point, he would beat the police even if I called them. How could I speak in code to them while making Frank think I was talking to Jimmy anyway? Or at least well enough to get them there quicker than he could now? Stay on the phone with me, he insisted. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking, I said. Tell him I want this fixed or I'm never coming back in here. What's he saying? I want to know how he's going to fix this. Frank jabbed a finger towards my shoulder, though he clearly had aimed for my chest. I turned away into the phone at the last second. I had expected him to back down purely by me having a witness on the phone. This was disconcerting. Cherylay, are you safe? Jimmy asked. He could tell that Frank was irate, or at least pretending to be. We both knew the situation did not call for this level of hostility. Frank had come in with the intention of messing with me, but I wasn't sure how far he planned to go. I don't know if he did either. But I had an idea. Oh, so you're on your way? I said out loud. I wanted Frank to know that the cavalry was on the way. Frank paused his rant. I continued. Yeah, that would probably be a good idea. Frank's very upset. He says he won't be coming back if this isn't fixed. I was only conveying Frank's message to buy a few more seconds. It was unnecessary since I knew that Jimmy could hear him. In my ear, Jimmy asked, Do you want me to call the police? I'm in the car, but not at the exit yet. Frank interjected, That's right, he better fix this. First he treats me like I'm some sort of criminal the other day, then you're calling me a liar. What kind of customer service is this? Frank had slightly calmed down. Slightly. Cherylay, tell him to take the order and I'll drive the other can out myself to him in the morning. Just get him out of the store. Okay, Frank, Jimmy says that you can take this order as it is and he'll personally bring the correct can to your job site in the morning. I said as conciliatorily as possible. I looked him straight in the eye and I said it like, this is your only option, get it and get out. Jimmy will be here in just a minute. You can wait for him to arrive or let him bring it to you tomorrow. He suddenly changed his tune. Ugh, I don't have time to wait around here all night. You tell him to make sure he's out there by 7.30 or I'm telling everyone what a joke this place is. He quickly backed towards the door. You tell him he could just bring all the rest of this out for my trouble. And he was pulling out of the parking lot seconds later. My heart still pounded, but I could breathe a little easier. I heard that. Let me know when he's gone. Jimmy said with the same obvious relief. He's gone. I saw him leave the parking lot. Okay, do you still want me to come out? If not, I'm coming up on a spot where I can loop back around. No, go on home. I think that he got scared off, particularly since he didn't even take the order he was ranting and raving about. Thanks, though, seriously. I was praying so hard that you would answer the phone. I said sincerely. I'm glad you knew you could call. When you kept blowing up my phone, it dawned on me there was only one reason you'd do that especially since I just told you and Joel to stop calling me so often when I'm off. I could hear the wry grin in his voice. Yeah, sorry about that. I figured you were intentionally not answering your phone for that reason. Thank God you understood. I'm fine now, but I was really scared, Jimmy. I've never seen him like that before. I know. I shouldn't have let it get this far, trust me. I'll be having a conversation with him in the morning. You won't be hearing from him again. Several months later, I was about to get married and move out of state. My last day there, I worked and closed alone. As I was sweeping the floor for the last time, I heard the side door chime. I stopped cold. It was Frank. He stood just inside the door, not moving. We just looked at one another for a moment. He seemed different contrite, a little softer, like the rigidity of that intimidating body language he'd used before, was gone. I waited. So I heard you're leaving. He started tentatively. I simply nodded. 
He nodded in return, shuffling his feet and nervously handling the keys in his pocket. After a couple of false starts, he found his words. My sister told me that the way I've been acting hasn't been very Christian-like. I don't know what I expected to hear, but that sure wasn't it. He went on. She said I shouldn't be saying things to you like I have, that people wouldn't know I'm a Christian by the way I acted. He looked at the floor, clearly humbled. Her saying that really bothered me. I don't want to give God a bad name. I wouldn't like it if someone thought poorly of him because I said I was a Christian but did bad things. I was stunned. So I wanted to come in and apologize to you for anything I've said or done that might have offended you. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I hope you will. At this, he looked up. Can you forgive me? I'm really sorry. I was silent a few seconds, still reeling and trying to wrap my mind around what he'd said. I, yeah, I, I forgive you. And I did. He seemed obviously repentant. There was too much change for this not to be a genuine apology. I watched the tension leave his body as he sighed and his shoulders let down. He seemed to be as surprised as I was when tears of relief sprang in his eyes. I don't think that he actually expected me to forgive him, or maybe how much he needed to hear me say it. He nodded in gratitude, then quickly cleared his throat, saying, uh -uh -uh. Well, that's all I wanted to say. Congrats on getting married. I hope things work out for you. I replied, Thank you. As he backed out of the door, that was the last time I saw him. For months, Frank had terrorized me. He'd annoyed, offended, harassed, and then scared me. He had made me feel helpless. I always thought if I'm not safe in a very public location with bright lights and the potential for customers at any moment, where am I safe? At times, he had tried to make me feel like the stupid woman only good for looking at, trying to work where only men should. I'll never go about life as oblivious to my surroundings as I did before working there. I've used this experience as a cautionary tale with my daughter and other women. That time period was scary and had left me feeling vulnerable and angry. Bitterness could have easily settled in. However, that afternoon, everything changed. I let it go. I forgave him. For real. I'll never forget, but I have forgiven. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence and harm against children. I have seen the face of evil. From Michigan Deputy. I work as a sheriff's office deputy in Michigan. At the time these stories took place, I was working for a department near central Michigan. To protect the families and victims of these stories, I will not disclose the exact area this occurred. I've been a deputy for five years. In that time, I've responded to every type of call possible, from noise complaints to triple homicides. I worked for an urban department that borders one of Michigan's largest cities. I use the past tense here because I recently moved to another sheriff's department in a different area of the state. Naturally, I've encountered all kinds of people. I expected this, as the basis of police work is talking to new people every day, gathering information on them, as well as the situation that caused them to call for police services. The changes day to day keep me on my toes and are one of the aspects of this job I enjoy the most. But I never thought I would encounter someone that truly struck me as evil. To make this story make sense and help you understand my perspective on it, I need to give some background info about myself. I was raised in a very religious household. My parents made my sisters and I attend church every Sunday, attend Bible school before or after the service, enrolled us in vacation Bible schools over the summer, paid for us to go to Christian summer camps, etc. The older I've gotten, I've struggled with organized religion and a lot of the shame and guilt doctrines that were drilled into me as a kid. I'm still generally spiritual. I believe God exists, as I do with angels, demons, the devil, and so forth. But I do not attend church currently, and I don't subscribe to any specific religion. I know evil exists in this world, but I always thought it existed in the acts people do 
the poor choices people make occasionally, and that at heart, everyone has good in them. Two calls for service in 2019 and 2021 changed the way I see people permanently. The first call was in the late fall of 2019. My partners and I got dispatched to a shots fired call at a local dive motel. Dispatch had gotten reports of a shooting in the parking lot, with one victim lying face down in the middle of the lot. The shooter was running back towards their room. We arrived on scene, located the victim, secured a perimeter, and began to render aid to the victim. I always carry lots of medical gear in my car, and I was therefore tasked with basic patient care until EMS arrived. I rolled the victim over onto his back, and for the first time, I saw the life leave someone's body. I saw his chest decompress, heard what sounded like his final breath leave his body, and I watched as the light behind his eyes dimmed away as I attempted to locate where he was shot. Unfortunately, there was nothing I nor EMS could do to save this man's life. I learned later that the bullet had entered on the bottom right side of his ribcage and traveled upward at a 45 degree angle, piercing right through his heart. After EMS tended to the victim, my sergeant tasked me and one of my partners to go to the suspect's room, which we had ascertained from witnesses on the scene. We got to the room and opened the door that was already ajar. Standing in the middle of the room was the suspect with his wife and three children. The suspect had his hands up with a cold, calm, emotionless look on his face. His wife and children were crying hysterically. We ordered the suspect to point to where the gun was, and he pointed to it, lying right in the middle of the room, completely unsecured. He hadn't even tried to hide the gun, never made a move like he was going to try to escape being taken into custody. At this point in my career, at the time of the case, I never had someone accused of such a heinous crime be so cooperative. The suspect was taken into custody without issue and transported to our department headquarters for lodging at the jail and interviews with the detectives. After all the work for the case was completed a few days later, I watched the tape of the detectives interviewing the suspect. He admitted to everything, not hiding a single detail and the whole time he talked in a calm, smooth, controlled voice, like he wasn't actually present in his own body as he explained what he did to kill this man. The entire time the detectives interacted with him, the suspect gave off a weird energy that spooked me a little bit. I could tell he had no remorse for what he'd done. It was like he didn't care about another human in the slightest. This second call for service happened in 2021. It started as a slow night. I was sitting at one of my normal traffic points, watching for any good stops. Suddenly, my radio crackled to life, and two of my partners got sent to a call of a completed suicide. The initial report was that the wife came home to find her husband dead in their bedroom. Seeing as it was a slow night, and these kinds of calls usually take a while, I decided to start heading that way to help my partners get done more quickly. As I began driving, dispatch gave out more information, which deeply disturbed me. They were changing the nature of the call to a murder-suicide. The caller had now reported that her two children, ages four and six, were dead along with her husband inside the home. Everyone available in my department began responding to the scene now. When I arrived, I was the second one there. As I put the cruiser in park, I could see my partner running across the front lawn into the home to get to the children. As I ran across the lawn as well, medical bag in hand, the same partner came running out of the house with the limp body of a six-year-old boy in his arms. We locked eyes and he shouted, he's still breathing. We began tending to the little boy as more officers and EMS arrived on scene. Seeing more people were going to come help, I left my partner on the lawn and retrieved the female caller, who was identified as the stepmother to the children and wife to the deceased male inside. 
Initially, when I pulled her aside to make sure she didn't re-enter the house and crime scene, she was crying. But I didn't see any tears. She was trying to scream like she was in pain, but it seemed like she was acting. Her emotions didn't seem right. They looked rehearsed, scripted, embellished, like she wanted me to believe she was hurting when she really wasn't. I escorted her to a chair on the porch so we could keep an eye on her while tending to the victims and getting the scene secured. My sergeant tasked me with another job, so I went inside the house for a little bit. When I came back outside, I saw the female was not in the chair I'd set her in. I asked one of the other deputies where she was, and no one seemed to know. After a couple of minutes, we found her sitting in her recliner inside the residence. The angle at which I entered the room she was in allowed me to see what she was doing on her phone. She was on Facebook, commenting on one of her friend's posts about a recent vacation. I stopped for a second and listened. This woman was calm. I did not hear any heavy breathing, any sniffling, like would normally occur after crying. She wasn't showing any kind of behavior indicating she was grieving or worried about her family. She wasn't calling her parents, she wasn't calling loved ones to tell them what happened, to ask for support. She was completely unbothered. Through the course of the night, I had several more encounters with her, and every time she seemed to lack emotion. Her effect was the same as the man from the homicide I described in the first story, completely emotionless. And, as the case was further investigated, I was informed by the lead detective that she was most likely the killer. Evidence was found in the house indicating her marriage was troubled, and journal entries detailing how she wanted out of her marriage so she could move to Texas and start a life with the woman she was having an affair with were found. As of writing this, the case is not officially closed but all evidence currently points to the female killing her own family. To this day, I believe I encountered two people who were the closest things to real-life demons I've ever seen. I've seen the worst of people's behavior in my career so far, but these two calls stand out as a league of their own. Even a man raging drunk with some sort of other substance in his system that just assaulted his family was nowhere near as terrifying as these two homicide suspects. These two people did not even seem human to me. They had human form, human appearance, and were in all likelihood human genetically. But what they did, how they acted, so cold and detached and unapologetic, that was all anything but human. I still believe everyone has good in them, but now, I also believe everyone has some evil in them, too. Some have more evil than others. Stay safe out there. How being a pizza delivery driver went from dull to terrifying. From Brian M. I should not be delivering pizzas at my age. I'm 42, and I used to work in finance. Then I lost my job because of the downturn in the economy, and like a pack of falling cards, my wife moved out, my friends stopped replying to my messages, and my house was repossessed. All I have left is my car. It's where I sleep now, and I use it to scrape up a living. One evening, I was taking a mega meat stuffed crust with wedges and dips out to an address in the center of town. It seemed like at that point, both my car and I smelled permanently of pizza. I assumed a new low point would come soon when I stopped noticing this, but as I parked and climbed out of the car, I felt as if someone had sprayed a melted cheese and tomato sauce scent body spray over me. I trudged over towards the block where the order was going. The place was pretty bland looking. I pressed the number for the apartment, and there was a crackle and a distorted greeting. I mumbled about having an order for someone. The pizzas had all blurred into one over the months I'd been having my soul destroyed by this job, and the moment I delivered this one I'd normally have forgotten about what the toppings were and the rest of the details. But things got seriously weird on this delivery. 
The door buzzed and I went in. The elevator wasn't working apparently, but luckily I only had to go up three flights of stairs. The lights in the stairwell must have been broken because they flickered on and off. I was feeling the beginnings of a migraine because of this by the time I reached my proper floor. I pushed open the door and set off down the hallway. It was carpeted, which once might have been nice, but now the carpet appeared to have been worn thin. I looked up from it. I was right at the apartment I needed to be at. The door, like the carpet, looked as if it had seen better days, but I didn't see a buzzer or bell, so instead I knocked. The door began to open and creaked as it did. I couldn't help but think the door needed some oil. I then put a smile on my face. The owner of the pizzeria I worked at made customer service a priority, and he was known to fire grumpy delivery drivers, and there was no way I could afford for that to happen to me right now. I held up the pizza box happily, ready to hand it over. Then I paused. The man who stood in the doorway then looked to be in his fifties. He had lank, greasy hair and clothes that looked as if they had not been washed in a very long time and he was holding one of his hands against his chest. It was wrapped up in a bandage through which seeped a patch of blood. Or it could be tomato sauce, I thought, and suppressed a manic laugh. The man mirrored my smile and asked if I could carry the pizza box inside his apartment for him. He held up his injured hand as an explanation. Now, to me, it seemed rude not to help, so I walked through into an untidy living room, then followed the man into a cramped kitchen. I could see more blood on the work surface and a blade with a crimson tip, so it didn't take a master detective to work out he had cut himself with a knife recently. He asked me to put the pizza box down and open it up for him. I did and wished him well. I had more orders waiting for me back at the pizzeria, and this delivery had already taken too long. I began to turn away and only glimpsed him getting a dish out of the refrigerator taking something out of it with his good hand and placing it right in the center of the pizza. A new custom ingredient among the different meats and cheeses and tomato sauce and base. I knew it was a finger because I saw the nail on it. My legs felt as if they were about to give way as I hurried for the door. I did not reply when he called after me, asking if I would like a slice. In this theater, you're never alone. From Hunter D. About 15 years ago, I started working at a small auditorium slash theater outside Detroit. It was a newer space at the time, so when me and my two friends were offered the opportunity to work there, we jumped at it. I'll refer to my friends as Johnny and Rick. It was a smaller space requiring minimal staffing, so for a long time the three of us were the only operational staff. Most days management would not be on site, so it was usually just the three of us, or some combination of a lower quantity. There were rumors that during construction, a worker had struck his head and fallen into the orchestra pit, where he passed away. Most people, myself included, laughed this off as ridiculous, but that rumor never died. One summer, we were scheduled to work a dance recital. We all showed up at 8 a.m. and quickly realized the client was not due to arrive until 10 a.m., not quite enough time to return home for a nap. We'd all worked the rehearsal the evening before, and the call time must have been lost in translation. Realizing we had time on our hands with nothing to do, my counterparts seized the opportunity for an impromptu breakfast, but I stayed back to perform some sound checks. So off they went, and here I was in the theater with only myself, my thoughts, and music. As I was sitting at the soundboard, running through the day's playlist, something caught my eye. All the inputs from our orchestra pit were receiving some kind of input or interference as shown on the VU meters, which are small lights that indicate when a channel is receiving a signal. Now, one or two channels receiving a signal or interference would not be out of the ordinary, 
but for all 12 channels in this one room to be acting up was very strange. My immediate thought was that Johnny or Rick must have left microphones down there, and they must have been picking up my sound checks. For those who are not familiar, an orchestra pit is a room in a theater, typically located beneath or in front of the stage, where the musicians are located during a musical production. Our orchestra pit was a concrete room beneath the stage with acoustically reflective panels. It was about 15 feet deep, stretching the width of the stage and lay 10 feet below the stage floor. The ceiling of the pit, further referred to as the cover, was modular and could be removed as needed to allow the music to fill the hall, but was kept installed at other times to increase the usable area of the stage, preventing people from accidentally falling in. At the time of these events, the cover was installed, meaning I was headed for a long, dark room. When I stepped into the pit, the lights would not turn on, which wasn't uncommon as we needed seemingly endless maintenance on our lighting system. So I pulled out my flashlight and I began examining every place a microphone could be plugged in. To my horror, I found that not only were there no microphones or equipment present of any kind, but the room was completely silent, despite my having left the soundcheck music playing to keep my nerves calm. I quickly made my way back upstairs to the soundboard, where the music was still playing and the VU meters for the pit channels had gone dark. I didn't move from there until my colleagues returned. Later that night after the event ended, I recounted what happened to my two colleagues, who did not seem surprised at all. They then told me of the events they'd experienced the night before. Every night while locking up, it had become something of a joke, before turning off the lights to yell, is there anyone in here? Then pausing a moment for a response, which there never was, before yelling, I'm turning out the lights, don't get hurt, and then turning the lights off locking the remaining doors, and leaving for the day. So they tell me after the rehearsal the night before, I'd left, but they stayed on site for about another hour, completing odds and ends tasks in preparation for the performance the next day. When they were ready to leave, they went through their normal process, walking through all the backstage and auxiliary rooms, making sure no one was present, shutting off lights, locking doors, etc., they arrived on the stage for the final step, the call-out of, is anybody in here? They did so and waited a moment, expecting the usual silence. That's when they heard a door close at the back. They called out, uh, custodial? To no response. Who's out there? They yelled, again to no response. Being the brave souls they are, they headed toward the area from which they believed the sound had come from. When they arrived, Rick noted that he'd checked this door on their walk through, and that the door was locked from both sides as it had been minutes earlier. Convinced it was just the sound of the building settling, or their minds playing tricks on them, they began heading back to the stage to finish their lockup, when there came the sound of another loud door slamming. This time, it came from a door only 30 feet away from them, at the top of a staircase which led down to the pit. They pulled out their flashlights, aiming them at the door, only to see the handle turning on its own. They immediately gave chase, expecting to find some kids from the show who might have hidden to have some fun after everyone left. The handle continued to move the entire time they ran towards that door. When they reached for the handle, the movement stopped. They threw the door open, preparing to confront whoever was on the other side, but to their shock, that stairwell was empty. Then there came the sound of yet another door slamming shut, this time at the bottom of that stairwell, which would be the door leading into the orchestra pit. Between the door that Johnny and Rick had just entered and the door that had just shut were five flights of stairs, Short flights, but five flights no less. It was certainly too far for someone to have traveled in what seemed like only a moment, I recall them explaining. 
They both bolted down the stairs with no more than their flashlights to guide them. The door they'd just entered was an emergency exit door, which didn't lock. But the pit was considered a secure area, and as such, could be locked from the outside. When they reached the door, Johnny reached for his keys, knowing he had locked the door minutes ago. But then Rick noticed the door was slightly ajar now. He reached for the handle instead, noting that he was able to pull the door open, but that the handle did not turn when he placed his hand on it, indicating that it was in fact locked. The two of them then heard what sounded like running towards the opposite end of the orchestra pit before they heard the sound of the door at the other end opening and slamming shut. Again, they gave chase. They threw open the door just in time to witness the door to a small mechanical room close. This is it, they thought, as they took a moment to pause and mentally prepare themselves, knowing this door was the only way in or out of that small room. Not knowing what to expect after their chase, Johnny pulled out his utility knife as a precaution. When they felt they'd mustered up as much courage as they could, they swung the door open and scanned the room with their flashlights. The room was empty, save for the equipment. Rick stood watch at the door while Johnny walked in, searching behind every piece of equipment, flashlight in one hand, utility knife in the other. Once Johnny was convinced he had thoroughly searched that room, the two hastily and shakily retraced their steps, relocking the doors and shutting off the lights. The two of them were out of breath and at a loss for words, only later questioning if they'd really seen and heard what they thought they did. They told me they neglected the, is anybody in here, call out this time, opting to just shut off the lights, lock the final doors, and make their exit as quickly as possible. Apparently, they were still questioning what had happened and thinking I would laugh at them, so they decided not to share their story with me that morning before leaving for breakfast. But upon hearing my story, they felt obligated to share theirs from the night before. As I'm sure you can imagine, our walkthrough that night was performed as quickly as possible, and as a team. Another strange occurrence happened only a few weeks later in the middle of a show. There was a comical scene in the show where the main character was supposed to have been shot out of a cannon to land in a different scene, and to portray this, a dummy would be dropped from the catwalks into the pit only for the main character to emerge and lean over the edge to show that he'd made it and was alive. On the night in question, the scene played out exactly according to plan. However, during our briefing that evening, it was noted that the door to the catwalks was locked, and the crew member who was supposed to have thrown the dummy was never able to access the area. At the time, no one else was up there. No one could have accessed it. So, to this day, we don't know who or what threw the dummy for the performance. Following these events, we would have the occasional oddities, like misplaced items turning up in wholly unexpected locations, strange sounds and shadows, etc. But nothing as major as our first few experiences with the unknown. Cursed from J. I work for a cable company. Going into folks' houses is something I do every day, so I come across a lot of different personalities, but nothing was going to prepare me for this. I was doing a job at someone's house, but the homeowners weren't there, so they had their friend present instead. About 15 minutes into the job, everything was going normally. It was really quiet, and the next thing I hear was a loud boom. It sounded like something big had hit the stove. There's an island that blocks the view to the stove, so I go over to look around. I find the guy on the ground having a seizure, full-on shaking, foaming from the mouth, making this loud grunting sound. I was horrified. I had never seen anyone have a seizure like this before. I didn't know what to do besides call 911. I called them, and they asked me all these questions about him, 
and I didn't even know the guy's name. Again, this wasn't even the owner of the house. When I got on the phone with him, he stopped shaking, but he still was not responding. So, all I could do was sit with him until an ambulance came. Now, the reason I titled this story Cursed was because it didn't stop there. Oddly enough, within five days, I witnessed two more seizures. One at Walmart from the cashier that was checking me out. The poor girl fell straight back into all the cigarettes and knocked everything over. But luckily, there were other people there to help. The last one was at another customer's house. I knocked on the door, saw him coming down the steps. He literally opened the door, and then it just slams on me. He had one of those entrances that has windows on the side, so I could see his head hit the glass. His body was blocking the door, so I had to force the door open with his body in the way. I got in, picked him up so he wasn't on his stomach, and I saw that he was bleeding from his head. He had ripped open some stitches on his side. I found out later he'd had surgery the day before. His wife pulled up right after it happened, and imagine the look on her face when she pulled up. I truly believed for a while I was cursed. For some time, I was nervous to go around anyone. Thankfully, everyone ended up being okay, and it hasn't happened again since. Elevator Incidents From Raul P. I worked at a loading dock of this well-known department store. We would operate the old-style elevator there, the kind where you had a lever to go up and down, and you had to stop and level it on the floor on your own. These elevators were well over 50 years old. This first story was about this elevator that was acting up. For some reason, the elevator would just slowly go up. If you didn't put on the brakes, it would just continue to rise. At the time, I didn't know the elevator was capable of that. I got a call at one point to check on something on a specific floor, so I took the elevator and went to the floor to check it out. I left the elevator on the floor and went to check out the thing they asked me to. When I got back, the elevator was gone, and the doors were wide open. I could see down the elevator shaft. I quickly closed the doors and called it in. My managers, team lead, and co-workers kept asking me, what do you mean the elevator left without you? I told them just before I was using it, the elevator had been acting up. It was slowly rising up. It was a scary sight to see an open elevator shaft. Someone could have fallen in. This second story has to do with me operating the giant freight elevator. These elevators were big. You could fit like two vans in them. This elevator was shared between us, the loading dock employees, and the housekeeping employees. They were in charge of all the trash. I was operating it, and everything was going smoothly. I suddenly got a call to help housekeeping, so I went to the floor to pick them up. Now, nothing was wrong so far while using it. It was only after I picked them up that I noticed something. When I picked them up, we were riding it and having small talk. There was this sudden weird metal scratching sound. It was only after a few minutes of hearing it, one of the guys asked, Hey, what is that? As soon as he said that, the whole elevator stopped. Then, the power was just cut off to the elevator, leaving us in pitch black. Thank God we were on a floor when it happened, and not stuck in between. We opened the door and got out immediately. I called it in, and when the lead came up to see what was wrong, he could not believe his eyes. He had never seen the elevator pitch black like that. It turned out the metal scratching was something that was powering the elevator, and it had come undone when we wrote it. I feel like these were two occasions where I narrowly avoided death or severe injury via elevator or elevator shaft. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, 
send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>